Okay, today I would like to do a review of the book called 40 Years of Psychic Research by Hamlin Garland. Now this is an old book, it came out in like 1936 I believe or something like that. Um, and I was reading Ghost Hunters by Deborah Bloom and it, it mentioned, well actually I was reading this book before, but it, this one kind of picks off where Ghost Hunters left off, because Ghost Hunters like quits around 1910 and by the way, these are basically historical books. They're not fiction. They're about people that were affiliated with the uh, Psychical Research Society in America and then the Society for Psychical Research in, in uh, Great Britain and the American Society for Psychical Research. So um, Garland was an author that I guess was fairly famous in the early part of the 20th century. and. Um, at this time, when he wrote this, he was like 75 years old, and it's entitled 40 Years of Psychic Research, and so it's basically about his on-and-off investigations of the paranormal. He was kind of an informal, ad hoc, uh, hobbyist investigator, if you will, or something. He wasn't like any kind of full-time psychical researcher. He was obviously an author, author on other topics, and a lecturer primarily. Uh, but this was this was like his side thing, and and what's really great about him when Garland is he was a, he was a healthy skeptic, even at the end of the book. You know, he just could not bring himself to believe that there were really spirits communicating through mediums and stuff. But but he had to admit there was definitely something going on. You know, there were definitely powers these some of these people had that couldn't be accounted for by science or conventional means. There was obviously some type of communication and telepathy going on and stuff and, and clairvoyance at the very least. Um, and definitely signs of, of telekinesis on a lot of different counts. So uh, it's it's a really good read and, and you, you come away with it with this picture, kind of like for, with Deborah Blum's book, but this picture of psychical research that's been going on for a long time by some really level-headed people that aren't by any means believers in anything. I mean, they spend as much time discrediting quacks as they do finding people that seem to have some credibility. And the, including Hamlin Garland and a lot of these other researchers, they all they all approach this stuff with a really open mind. You know, most of them are not spiritualists or anything at all, so most of them don't even believe that mediums are talking to the dead when they claim they are and stuff. But uh, uh, they they want to look into it. You know, they want to look into it with an open mind, and, and they, they despise people that reject psychic phenomena or paranormal phenomena out of hand, like the mainstream science community and stuff uh, that gave them a lot of flack at the time, because a lot of the people in these societies were mainstream scientists. I mean, Garland wasn't, but a lot of the people were, and, and they would get a ton of flack from their peers. Some of them would get threatened with losing their jobs and stuff, and but a lot of them would just stick to their guns and keep looking into it because uh, they thought it deserved it. So, um, Hamlin Garland, I think, he, he does such a terrific job because he wasn't overly critical, but he was still rigorous. So whenever he got a, an account of a medium that seemed to be worth something and then turned out to be worth something, he'd write it down and he'd take notes and, and he accumulated a bunch of these over the years and he tells some pretty good stories. Now, he changes the names of the mediums so that to hide their identity and stuff. So I guess you'd have to do some research to find out who the heck they really were. But uh, he definitely found some that had some pretty impressive abilities. Uh, most of these were along the lines of mediumship from the late 1800s, early, early 1900s. And um, there would be things like slate writing, where if you're not familiar with that, you basically take a couple of slates and, and close them and tie them together with a pencil or a piece of chalk inside or something and and you'd get writing on the inside. Now there are lots of tricks for doing this like mediums would be good at swapping slates in and out underneath the table or uh, preparing them chemically so that they looked invisible but then you just shake them up and writing magically appears. And so that was known and he did find a lot that were quacks and stuff but he only really reports the ones that he thought were worthy of note. And uh, one cool example is this medium that, that had this technique of taking, taking just one slate and uh, putting a, a goblet, this isn't a goblet, but you know, putting a goblet on it and uh, holding it underneath the table with 
the sitter's hand touching the medium's hand underneath the book to make sure there's no monkey business going on. And um, what they would get is they would get writing underneath, and when you take off the goblet, underneath where the goblet had been sitting, there would be writing on the slate. And the goblet had been full of water, so it obviously would have been spilled if anybody tried to like switch anything out or anything. Uh, so it was pretty foolproof. And it also demonstrates a common aspect of that slate writing technique and its variations. And that was that it was very feasible for these, these whoever it was, the mediums or entities or whatever, to, to mark up these surfaces without any room to write. And, and upon chemical analysis, they turned out to be real pigments uh, of various types, like chalk or crayon or, or pencil and stuff. Uh, and they turned out to be overlapping each other in the correct ways. So that if you wrote something on a slate before and then there was writing on top of it, it literally would be on top of the, of the, the previous writing, showing that there was no previous chemical preparation and stuff, uh, like invisible ink or anything like that. Oh, and yes, tons of accounts of trumpet mediums generating voices and stuff um, under Riggler's control. He would always, like, tie the me mediums down and tack down their sleeves and do all kinds of stuff to make sure they couldn't move. And, and towards the end, there's this one lady that they would even have this apparatus that, to put in her mouth where she could, she would, like, exhale. And when she exhaled, that's when these other entities would talk. But she was just blowing air through this apparatus, and there's no way you could talk through it. And they had it so it covered her mouth and everything, and, and he even tried it. Tried saying words to the thing, and it wouldn't work. And, and uh, they would still get, get crystal clear speech from these entities and stuff coming out of the trumpet or elsewhere. The trumpets would be levitated a lot, books would be levitated, tables would be rocking. And, uh, I don't know, just a ton of, of accounts of these phenomena. You read, you're like, oh, this can't be true, this guy's got to be full of it. But if you're familiar with the... Uh, the work of the Society for Psychical Research and a lot of the stuff they looked into, they did encounter stuff like this. You know, basically their take on it was it was 90% crap, but a good 5 or 10% really showed that there was something going on. And, and uh, you know, they, they didn't really make any claims as to what or how the things were achieved, but definitely that it was, it was outside of the realm of normal conventional science or accepted scientific laws and things. But uh, to me, one of the most interesting accounts by far is that the, towards the end of his life he found uh, uh, some retired military guy that that claimed to be able to generate voices just out of his solar plexus you know by his uh, in his abdomen without using a voice at all and things and and they only he didn't have a lot of time to like test this guy or or anything but he and his buddy he and, he and Stuart Edward White, actually, I think were the two, uh, the guy who wrote the Betty book, uh, were with this guy. And, and what the guy could do is he would take his trumpet, like a megaphone-type trumpet, you know, and, and uh, hold it up to his abdomen, and then you could put your ear against the small end, you have a big end up to his abdomen, and you could hear, like, voices whispering through it and stuff. And not only that, you could hear environmental sounds, like, for instance, Stuart, and they checked it out to make sure there's no electronics going on, nothing hidden, you know, they did all that, did our homework. But Stuart Edward White, he like, he like took the thing, and when he listened to it, he could hear the sound of wind in the trees and dogs barking in the distance. And as if this had opened up a window into some other dimension, or another, you know, another place across the globe or something. And, and it's kind of like listening into a seashell, but you really did hear something, you know, something another place and that just gave me the willy just says chills up and down your spine when you think about it but uh so I, this book is really a great account it kind of uh it's his, his research was not continuous by any stretch of the imagination because it's just whenever he had a chance to look into things but it does cover a 40-year span in which he looked into the stuff and he, he accounts for the most remarkable cases that he could not explain by conventional scientific laws and things and uh it's just a really good read covers the workings of those psychical research societies in the uh, early third of the 20th century. And if you're at all interested in that kind of thing, go for it. You won't be disappointed.